So your book is called A Woman Makes a Plan, but you talk about in your book how plans are often sideswiped and you have to make a new plan. So what is it about the plan and not holding on to it too tightly? Well, you do want to hold on to it tightly because you've got this plan and it's going to be great. And then, you know, all sorts of things get thrown at you and then you are miserable. And then you have to say, now I need to make another plan. And what my book says is that I stayed in miserable situations too long, so maybe you don't have to. <laughs> and you talk about untraditional ways that you pushed your career forward when you were met with resistance. Yes. Can you talk to me about that? Well, everything you do, first of all, as a dietitian, I actually started my own practice. You know, I was 21. I started my practice at 22 because I was fell pregnant on honeymoon. So you really can't go looking for a job. And uh, so, but just from home, you know, small practice picking up over the years. And then, so that's why you figure out, well, you have to work from home because you've got kids. And then you find that you become very successful and you think, maybe I can look better than this by not being absolutely miserable every day <laughs> in this bad marriage. And when you moved to New York, you signed with a very big modeling agency and it wasn't going better than like you expected it I to know. go. So how did you deal with that? I was very sad because, I, you know, I would go into the agency and I, well, first of all, I've had some big campaigns and then I, I would join this, the, the larger agency. And uh, they just kept on saying, yeah, I'm just not good enough and nobody wants to see me at castings. And I'm thinking, but surely they could just meet me and then maybe, you know, and then sometimes they would, I would say, look, I've joined you for six months. The first jo job I went to, you book I booked the job. So now I don't have any more castings and I didn't join you to stop modeling. And they said, we're doing our best, we're doing our best. Uh, don't don't complain, you know, we, we're doing our best. And then. Then, then they'd send me out for, for one casting. And then the casting director would see me uh, you know, lining up with 30 women, come and grab me and say, at long last, we've got you. And they'd bring me to the front and they'd say, we want you for this job. And I said, great. And then they said, because you just haven't been available. And I'm thinking, why am I not available? And then I would mention to my agency and then they would scream at me saying, well, you know, we, we're doing our best and, and they, they're mixing you up with other models. And I'm thinking, oh, not many models my age. So uh, uh, this went on for, for a long time and every time I try, uh, complained they would scream at me that they're doing their best. And, and then I, I started getting model agencies all around, all surrounding New York as well as Europe and then um, I could uh, model. Have you had moments of lapses of confidence and what do you do to help get over those? Yes, you have many lapses of confidence. You are defeated many times where you think I'm in this dark tunnel and I I can't climb out of it. And you, you just have to keep on thinking, how do I get out of this bad situation? And uh, you, um, you know, sometimes the law has to change <laughs> for you to be able to, to get uh, divorced uh, or move out of a contract. You know, you have to be able to uh, fight for yourself. But I was always a softy, so I always trusted people. I was always didn't know why they would be malicious and what, or why would they be nasty. Uh, what's what's the advantage to them? And uh, I guess people just like control and power. And if they can have power over you, it gives them joy. But um, it's not right. <laughs> Change seems to be something that helps people grow a lot, but it's also very scary for most people. Reading your book is like one major life change after another. Is change something that you lean into or it's something that you were forced to do? And every time I was, it was to better my situation and it was always scary. And I just went into the deep end, you know, and then I kept swimming until I came to the surface. It, it takes a long time. So when you move it, like to a new city or a new country, you know nobody. I work for myself, so it's not like I had colleagues around me. And it takes you a while to, to get friends or meet people and to build up your practice so that, I mean, I was, my kids were eating peanut butter sandwiches <laughs> for dinner and to be able to actually buy a chicken, you know, once a month, once a week to have some chicken and potatoes. And, vegetables so that was that was always a thrill <laughs> so you look forward to good things like that <laughs> you raise incredibly successful children you have three children um can you tell me what you did when you were raising them that made them the way that they are today 
Well, I think it's similar to my parents. You know, they were working all the time. I only saw them at six o'clock in the evening for dinner. And they just made us independent. We started working for them when they were, when we were young. And in the same way, my children were helping me. And they were very aware that I had my practice at home and they need to uh, be uh, well behaved and do their own homework because I didn't have time to work with them. And they were, they were really good kids. I was very lucky. And you let them follow their own passion. They followed their own passions and they all went in different directions. And what is so magical about the age 12? Well, you don't know it's a magic age until you tell your stories and then you say, oh, actually, by 12, we already knew what they were going to do. And then, they, as I said, they went in different directions. When, when we moved to Toronto, my funds were blocked. So I didn't, uh, I was a research officer at the University of Toronto. So they could have come there for free if they studied, uh, or very little, if they studied uh, medicine or law. But Elon and Kimball wanted to study business. And then Elon went on to study physics as well. Tosca wanted to study film. So they, they had to get their own scholarships, they had to get their own loans, and they had to support themselves, and they did it. And looking back at the way you raised your children, what is the best gift you think you gave them? Well, I think I was strict, and they tell me I was a pushover, so, <laughs> so there you go. Yeah, I think being polite and considerate of others and doing good for others, I think they saw that as a dietitian, they saw me doing that, and they all do good things for others. And at 69, you became the oldest cover girl in history. How did they get you to do that campaign? What was that process like? Well, first of all, I was Instagram. So Instagram got me IMG Models, which they said they, uh, there's a beauty uh, company that's interested in me. And I thought, oh, yeah, you know, you hear these things. <laughs> and then they said, oh, we're going to be meeting with CoverGirl. I said, OK. And I go there and I see all my Instagram photos up on the, up on the mood board. And I'm saying, hmm. That's, that's uh, interesting. And then they're talking as if I was the cover girl already. And then afterwards I leave with my agent and I said, am I a cover girl or not? She said, yes, the contract, we've got the contract, we're working on it. And I said, oh, until I sign that contract, I'm not saying anything. And, and it, well, I wasn't allowed to say anything. And then when that contract came, it was just fantastic. I just thought, wow. It's like every model's dream to be the face of a makeup brand, and now, I've, now I am. And the commercial, I still remember seeing it for the first time. It talks about age head-on, and it's very moving. Um, what was that process like, and what did you think about the campaign when you were shooting it? Well, I thought they made me look fabulous. They really did. And then they wanted me dancing on a rooftop, and they wanted me walking in the street. They, they had a lot of ideas. and. And um, yeah, I'm willing to do it all, yes. And I was treated like a, a, a big star because I had my own trailer, a large trailer, and I had a, a double who was there for the lighting and I'd never had that before. So this, this was all new to me and uh, very exciting to be looked after so nicely. And where do you think we could still need more age diversity in media? Oh, we need age diversity everywhere, you know, because you know, as men get older, they, they are still in the media, still everywhere, and uh, women are, are neglected and they, you know, they, have, they don't want to book them anymore. And my saying is that 50% of CEOs should be women, 50% of presidents should be women, because we'll, we'll have a kinder, gentler world. And also, uh, so women should support women to get to that position, but men should support women too. We're not competition to men, we just think the best person should be able to get the job.